Okay, hopefully everyone's having a fantastic day. It's a little rainy weather here in Sacramento, but we're talking a little real estate, guys. Um, the biggest thing is, like, you know, interest rates, yes, they are going down. Inventory is so low. But are we becoming like a renter nation? Is it one of those things where companies like BlackRock are coming out, buying a whole bunch of houses? I mean, and are we becoming a renter nation? Is it becoming one of those things where it's just unaffordable to buy a house? And first time home buyers are kind of in trouble and it's becoming less of a reality and more of a dream. As always, I got Aaron here. Also, I want to hear what you guys have to say. So anything we talk about, please voice your opinions. We will stop uh, and answer your questions. Aaron, how are you doing? I'm I'm doing good, man. It's uh, you know, it's it's definitely seems like it's becoming you know somewhat of a of a renter nation. You know, the uh, the cost of doing business is, you know, becoming more and more as as time goes on. You know, just because home prices continue to to creep up, and you know, unless we're just going to magically have like nine or ten million homes built overnight, you know, we're we're going to constantly kind of be behind the eight ball. So having BlackRock and Blackstone and Vanguard and all those big institutional investors involved in, in buying houses that that certainly doesn't help the cause. But, uh, you know, interest rates are sure making a lot of noise right now, you know, almost as much noise as the thunder and lightning from last night, which woke my whole family up as we thought like a house had fallen on top of our house. But, uh, you know, last week and, you know, over the last couple of weeks, uh, mortgage rates have been trending lower. Um, you know, they're not 2% though, so don't bust out the champagne and caviar yet. Um, but we're finally not just heading in the right direction, but consistently trending in the right direction. And, you know, I, I would say that the, the most important thing that came, you know, in the interest rate world recently was last week, the Federal Reserve meeting and the a uh, dot plot map that basically shows the 16 Fed members what their forecasts are for interest rates. And, you know, it, uh, seven, you know, they're, they're looking at 75 bips to 100 bips in rate reductions uh, in 2024 or more. Um, so it's, it's definitely going to uh, become more affordable in terms of like the interest rate that you'll be able to get on a mortgage. But you got to remember that home prices aren't static because there's not a lot of houses out there and builders can only build so many at a time. Uh, you know, they kind of they don't want to flood the market with inventory either because it's it's good business for them to have, you know, less inventory, obviously. So, you you know, there's there's a whole lot of dynamics at play and all of them make it pretty difficult to, you know, to become a homeowner. But there's a lot of advantages of, of, you know, being a homeowner, which is why everybody keeps duking it out in the streets to, to win that, you know, win that listing. Well, I mean, here's something like Greg Cardone was all over the news basically saying that, you know, the United States is going to be turning into a renter nation. Mortgages are too expensive. And he even threw out the idea that we're going to see longer mortgage terms. He was talking about like a hundred year mortgage. I mean, granted, he's, you know, he's a lot of show, but what do you sure. think as far as that goes? I mean, as far as interest rates may be going higher, as far as the, you know, income people are making, people are saying, you know, there's just no way I can afford it. Do you see stuff like that happening kind of in the future? Cause that could help us out as far as, you know, that could help someone who's renting that says, you know, I do want to buy a house, but based on getting a 30 year old, 30 year mortgage paying maybe 7% or even 6.5, you know? It's, it's kind of one of those things where, number one, I'm not 100% secure in my job. I need to make sure I pay my rent or my mortgage. I just don't know if I can. What do you think about that as far as longer mortgage terms? It's, it's certainly possible. I mean, Japan's been doing 100-year mortgages for a long time. You know, they got a very different society, though, than the, that we do. You know, they're much more generational in, in terms of those things. Uh, you know, if you go back in time a little bit, maybe 10, 15 years ago, you could get a 40 year uh, mortgage. That was like a popular uh, alternative to an interest only loan. Um, the thing is, though, that spread, you know, stretching out the term by 10 years, 20 years, it, it doesn't make that big of an impact on the monthly payment. I mean, sure, it does reduce it, but it's not like it takes a $5,000 payment and makes it $1,000. Um, you know, you're more so talking about taking a $5,000 payment and maybe making it like 4,600 bucks or, you know, something, something like that. And so there's still going to be this, you know, massive affordability gap, I believe. Um, 
I mean, it's, I hate to say this cause it's kind of like, you know, a little, you know, could be crass or whatever, but I mean, you know, if you want to be a homeowner, you're going to have to figure out how to, how to make more money basically so that you can afford to purchase a house. Cause it's, uh, you know, short of the government stepping in and saying, you know what, hey, we want everybody in America to become a homeowner. And so we're going to subsidize free mortgages or something like that. Uh, you know, we're in a free market capitalist society where, you know, banks uh, that are ultimately lending out the, you know, the money, they, they want to get a return on their investment. And the, you know, companies and builders that are actually, you know, building out these houses, they, they only have the ability to do so much and, and also, you know, they have to do it within a way that makes them money. And so making really cheap houses with really cheap mortgages, that's just not, you know, that's not a winning business model. Um, you know, unless you're the government and you're just subsidizing things, but then we're going to have inflation problems, you know, if we do that. So I don't know, man, it's, it's a, it's definitely a, you know, uh, you know, that, that whole saying like stuck between a rock and a hard place, you know, a lot of buyers are going to find themselves in that spot where, you know, they're going to have to get creative. They're going to have to, you know, go hustle more, go get their side gigs, whatever they got to do to, you know, to get their foot in the door. Um, because I do still believe that even with where home prices have gotten, um, you know, and, and how far, you know, stretched out affordability has become, Owning a house is the winning playbook if you want to build wealth. I mean, you got to have a place to live, right? And so if I got to have a, a roof over my head and I'm going to have to pay somebody to live there, um, you know, nobody's going to let me live for free. Um, you know, I'm not a, a college kid living in my parents' basement, you know, right? So if I'm going to have a monthly expense, well, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if that monthly expense was my mortgage? And, you know, over time, owning real estate is going to create equity and wealth and all that stuff, which, you know, that's the, the benefit of being a homeowner, um, you know, along with the stability and tax, you know, benefits and stuff like that. But mainly it's the, the massive amount of wealth that you build over time by just living in the, in the home and making payments on it. It's going to prices go up. So, you know, uh, it's. It's not easy, um, but it's definitely it's it's worth a worthwhile pursuit for those that you know stay after it. Yeah, no, and, and you know, Bob, Bob, hey, Bob. By the way, long time no see. How have you been? Hopefully, you're having a good holiday season. And everything too. I kind of thought you did the typo thing too. He said interest rates only loan is about the same as a hundred year mortgage. Extending the term is not going to help much. Yeah, no, I yeah. I, yeah. Um, and that's the thing. It sounds great, right? A hundred year mortgage. Ooh, that means, oh, let me think about that. Oh, shoes, man. That's like a third of my payment, a hundred years. Yeah. But if you do the math, like Aaron said, it's not going to save you that much. Um, it's just right now, it's, it's just going to be one of those things that that even a hundred year mortgage is still going to lock a lot of people into renting. And I, I agree with Aaron too. It's like, I mean, home buying, um, how can I say it? It's something that really does make sense. Um, but the only thing truthfully right now is, I mean, I was talking to Aaron this offline before we started our live and it's like, you know, it's a hard thing. It's kind of hard to jump in right now if you're renting and you're seeing the, the economy, like you're seeing kind of like now the jobs report, you know, all that stuff kind of, and you're kind of seeing the shape we're in right now. And you're saying, man, inventory is low. I know interest rates are dropping. I, yeah, I would love to buy a house, but it's just a shaky economy right now as far as going into election year. It's just a hard thing sometimes for people to just say, maybe it's just not my time, you know? And like I said, we're always about timing your life and not the market. Um, but it does, I guess I, what I'm saying is like the things that are happening right now definitely play into the idea of leading us into renting instead of buying this year. You know what I mean? Like interest rates going down, that's definitely helping. But like, you know, Aaron, like we were talking about offline, there's no inventory still, you know? And one of the things that like Mr. Cardone or Cardoni, I don't know, he was saying, oh yeah, now that, you know, when interest rates start dropping, inventory is going to flood the market. Grant Cardone, Cardoni, whatever, you're wrong. It's not going to happen. I got a lot of people who have their 2.75s and even if the market drops down to 5% interest rates, they're pretty good. Not to mention in Sacramento, a lot of people, when they did their upgrade, it was to their forever home. They cashed in on single family homes that they bought, maybe their first home, and then they jumped into their forever homes. I mean, majority of people I worked with were like, 
We're going to sell our home. We're cashing out. The market's tough. I get it. But we got 2.75. We can now buy a little bit more of a house than we normally could buy. We got our house. We're happy and we're staying put. And if I threw out, if I made a cold call and said, hey, we got a 5% interest rate. Do you want to sell? I don't know if we'd be friends anymore. <laughs> you know, so I we're not flooding the market at 5%. More people might sell at, seven, at 5%. But at the same time, I, I had a conversation with a with a client today, and I was like, "I could still sell your house for a whole bunch of money right now. It's not a hurting market. It's not like we don't have buyer demand. There is buyer demand. There was a buyer demand a month ago. We could still sell your house if if you're realistic. We could probably get you more than you probably thought for your house. So it, it's not like things are changing too much for sellers. It's not like it's like oh now now we can like really get you a hundred thousand dollars more in your house. It's it's not. Sellers have had it like. It's been a seller's market for a long time. Sellers have had the benefit in this market left and right. So just because there's additional buyer demand doesn't mean you're getting someone out of a 2.75 at a five or five and a half or at six. You know what I mean, Aaron? No, not not at all, man. And, you know, I I love some Grant Cardone at times. I mean, like his energy and, and the like his book 10X and just getting after it and, and being, you know, working hard. I love that stuff. But some of the stuff that, that he puts out on social media about, you know, real estate, it, he's, he's like, he's stoned or something. I, I don't know. I don't know what the deal is. And it's, it's at the end of the day, you know, it's not realistic that somebody, you know, your, your normal, you know, average consumers, they're not going to go out and buy apartment complexes and, you know, be, be massive landlords. You know, they, they work somewhere, they've got a W2 job and they're just trying to buy a house. So, you know, Grant Cardone's advice is kind of wacky a lot of times, but, you know, he's got some fun energy, you know, that he's got that like spicy Louisiana guy, right? <laughs> he is like, he is a seller among sellers. You know oh, what I mean? Totally. He is like, he is that guy, man. He is just doing it. Um, and, you know, I like him because he's got gray hair like me. We gray hair folk need to stay <laughs> together. But other than that, you know, it's just sometimes I listen to his stuff and, you know, he interest rates, this and that and everything too. Um, but I think for you guys out there, you know, if you're listening to the show and everything too, and if you want to talk a little Sacramento, we're always down for that. But time your life, don't time the market. It's it's not, it's shaky times right now in the economy. And I don't mean it's brutal, but at the same time, it's like, you know, right now seasonally, it's like kind of like one of those, we're all shopping, right? We're all getting Christmas presents or holiday presents. We're all doing that stuff. We're coming into next year, you know, like Aaron said, like we're all going to get our, you know, w, W2s and all that stuff too. And we're coming into a year of, of an election. You know, a lot of us are self-employed and we don't know what that means, you know, mm -hmm. which direction. It, and it's, it's not really the most secure time in the world to say, Hey, I'm upgrading, getting a house. Um, now what you notice here in Sacramento is, um, like I said, with COVID, with the 2.75s, the majority of the people that I worked with, they weren't saying to me, hey, we're jumping on a 2.75 to buy a house for a few years and then we're going to sell it. And then we're going to move into a bigger house. A lot of people knew the 2.75s, we weren't going to see that again. And so they were, they were swinging for the fences. You know, they're like, oh, mm -hmm. 2.75, look what I can afford. Okay. I like that. And they went for it, you know, and that's kind of what we're seeing in Sacramento specifically. I mean, people, I, I was upgrading so many people to these like double or triple the square footage houses. Yeah. Um, and because we are in Sacramento too, I mean, you know, up here, we're not like Bay Area folk where it's like, we like, you know, like a house, but we're looking for the, you know, going down to North Beach or the fine dining restaurant. We're going to be out all the time. In Sacramento, our lifestyle is a little different. It's more about like, we got the pool, we got the Traeger, we're bringing people in and we're having a barbecue, we're hanging out, we're gathering people in the house. Um, mm -hmm. And so we like it, a resort style living. That's kind of what we do here. And a lot of people bought those type of houses. People from the Bay Area yep. saw my videos, I guess, and wanted those type of houses and then they got it. I have not gotten too many calls from people that have said, hey, Mark, you know that house I bought three years ago, 2.75 interest rate? I'm thinking about selling it. I want to get a house at a 5.5% interest rate, um, but I can't buy the size house I just got, so I'm going to buy a smaller house without a pool. I haven't got those calls. It's weird. Go figure. Dude, the, know, only, so. the only people that I've talked to that are past clients, that, and it's only been a small handful of, of folks that basically they, they bought in – you know, late 2020, 2021, you know, even the very beginning of 22 when, when rates were still, you know, low. Um, and, and they're like, Hey, I got to sell my house. Why? It's not because of what you're talking about. They're not upgrading. Like a couple of them, unfortunately, they lost their job. 
and then a, a handful of them, uh, they worked for employers who said, don't worry, you can be remote, you know, trust us. And then all of a sudden they're like, hey, uh, this whole remote work from home thing's not working for us, so everybody's got to come back to the office. So, uh, you know, a couple of, of, you know, people, it was like, you know, all of a sudden they're going to have to commute three, four, five hours to get to work. So obviously that's that's not realistic. And they were faced with losing their job potentially or having to sell and move back to the Bay. So, uh, you know, there's, uh, I, I would say if anything, that's probably the, the, you know, the scenario for people that are, you know, selling out of a situation like that to go back to something more expensive. I mean, why else would you do it, right? No, I mean, what we're seeing normally, and it's still this way, even with more buyer demand, interest rates dropping, you know, it's we're still seeing the 3Ds, man. What's called divorce, death, and um, departing, departing the state, city, or departing whatever. I mean, those are the 3Ds of people who are basically selling right now. And that's kind of what we're still seeing. We haven't had too many people call up and say, hey, look, interest rates now are 6.3. I want to sell my house. And I'm looking to jump into a new, a bigger house. Now, here's a caveat on that: if you do believe the interest rates are going lower next year, which everyone, all the all the lenders that I know, Aaron too, that could be the smartest move. And I know it sounds like, oh, wait, wait, Mark, hold on, you just pivoted. If you are someone who's looking to move, and I was talking to my uh, my father-in-law about this, and I, I told him I was like, look, this is this is the idea right now, right? Like, let's say you are someone, let's say you're that one person who says, you know what, I, I missed the boat for the 2.75s, I didn't have my ducks in a row, but I want to buy a house um, and I'm looking at these interest rates go down. I can't wait for summertime. Interest rates will be in the fives maybe. And then I'm going to have my pick of the houses. Er, breaks stop right now. You're not going to. The resale market is going to be super low in inventory because you're not the only one who's probably looking for a house. It could make more sense right now where you brave the rain, the rain that's out there right now, start looking for something. And I don't mean something looking for just anything, but looking for something you really, really like because it's seasonal, because people want to get rid of stuff off the books at Q4, maybe jump into something now, cross your fingers, hope the crystal ball and a lot of the lenders are right. And then six months from now, when rates are at the, in the fives, then you refinance and you don't have to deal with the market of spring and summer where if we mm -hmm. are down to the fives, we have low interest uh, inventory, it's going to be a frenzy out here and you're not going to want to deal with this like, hey, the conversations, hey, you got to waive your appraisal contingency, no investigations, um, and we're up against three cash offers from the Bay Area. That's not fun for anyone. You know what no. I mean, Aaron? Dude, it's not fun at all. It's not fun for your lender. It's not fun for your agent. And it's not fun for you and your family. Oh my God, it's terrible. You know, the, I, I, I sometimes it's like, and, and I've had a lot of friends buy with me as well. And it's like, you know, I, I, I get to have a, a more candid conversation with, with those folks, I think. And, you know, it's like, you know, you guys are, are, you know, it's like blood sport. You're, you're like John Claude Van Damme entering the, the ring and, you know, like you got to fight to get that house and you're going to get beat up a lot. You're going to lose a lot. You're going to be frustrated a lot. And ultimately when you do win, winning is more of a, like, you need to shift your mindset that instead of winning being like, you got exactly what you wanted. It's that, you liked the house and your offer got accepted. But like you said, you had to waive your contingencies. You had to, you know, pay X amount over. You had to do all these things in order to make that happen. And that just comes from competition. You know, if oh, yeah. like I, right, right before the show, I had to run up to, to Target real quick to, to grab a couple of things for the office. And I was thinking to myself, I'm an idiot, of course, but I was thinking to myself, you know, it's like two o'clock in the afternoon. There's not going to be anybody there. And of course, you know, it's Christmas, right? And so every, the whole store, it was insane. I almost walked out and just said, screw it. I'll live without the things that, you know, that I was going to pick up. But it's like the same thing, you know, Christmas, it creates that demand. Low interest oh, yeah. rates creates demand. And all of a sudden the cash registers are backed up with 40 people in line and it's a zoo. So it's like the same exact thing is going to happen with the, with the resale market and with new construction. I mean, resale markets are going to be way more competitive than, than the new home market just because there's far less resales available. Um, but even on the new homes, I mean, 
you know, right now there's still some decent incentives, especially with depending on the community, you know, all that stuff better than I do. But I mean, you know, some communities or, or floor plans or lots or whatever, you got some pretty sweet incentives still, you know, you fast forward in time a little bit when rates are lower and you have more buyers trying to, to, you know, become homeowners, supply, demand, Builders are going to be like, hey, we can fulfill all these sales without having to give these incentives or do this or that. And, you know, we, we get back in that scenario where, like, you know, you get to put your name on a waiting list and it's like a random lottery that the builder calls you and, you know, you you won. Now you get to write an offer on a house kind of situation. So um, right now is definitely, I mean, uh you know, it's, it's a great time to buy if you're, you know, you can afford it and you're stable and, you know, you're not like you were talking about the economy earlier and how we're, you know, I'm pretty sure, you know, it's a safe argument that we're in a recession, but, you know, let's say that we're not and we're entering into one. Right. And so there's some doubt into, you know, the economy. So if you're concerned about your job, um, then it would be a horrible idea to buy a house right now. You know, you, you get yourself, committed to something financially and then all of a sudden you got to pivot that's not a good situation to be in but if you're if you're stable and you know you're feeling really good about your future um i I still feel like the smart money move is buy now before everybody else is trying to buy and right now specifically i mean i personally i bought my house two weeks before christmas um and it you know the same scenario that i'm talking about here where far less competition And I was able to uh, negotiate more um, because I didn't have everybody and their mom trying to compete with me because everybody else was out, you know, Christmas shopping and, you know, doing the the holiday season thing and not wanting to shop for houses and deal with the rain and all that stuff. Whereas I was like, I don't care. I'll do it. You know, I I, want to buy. And so I was able to, to uh, get in a lot easier than it would have been for me if I would have waited, you know, until the spring or whatever. So something to be said about buying a house during Christmas. Well, I think the other thing, too, is number one is uh, most of the houses you're going to see that are available right now are are vacant. Right. A lot of people don't mm-hmm. list during this time of the year if they're going to be doing the Christmas tree and all that stuff, too. So sure. they're easy to access. Right. So it's like call your realtor, go out, see some houses. Easy peasy. Scheduling ain't a problem. The other thing too is, and this is something a lot of people don't factor in, is that because it's a slower time of the year for contractors, for movers, and all that stuff too, a lot of that stuff is a little bit cheaper during the off season, which is this. Sure. Contractors, for the most part, you know, are I don't want to say hurting, but you know, a lot of their outside jobs are non-existent right now because it's raining. And so you can get a person scheduled right now. You can get them probably a little bit cheaper than they normally would be. They'll be grateful for the job and you can keep it going. So there are some benefits to moving this time of the year. Um, but like Aaron said, I've, I've, I always work with people during this time of the year where we get something lucky, something happens, offer comes in. And not to mention in this type of market, it's still a little kind of dicey as far as like pricing a house, as far as demand, as far as what goes, what doesn't. Um, and what I mean is there, there's a lot of confusion in the market as far as should houses be selling like that or sh- because it's a seasonal low or, you know, it's a slow time of the year. Should they be sitting a little bit more? So that, that kind of like that mm-hmm. little subterfuge allows you to maybe submit an offer and someone's not getting any other offers. And they're like, huh, you know, maybe this is it. Maybe this is all I'm going to get. Um, yep. Instead of like, maybe like waiting it out and saying, Hey, I know interest rates are going down. I'm going to be, I'm pulling my house off the market and I'm listing it in spring. I mean, some people like, you know, we've submitted offers during this time of the year and just because people want to get it off the books or maybe they're not seeing anything else, the weather's happening, they don't want to maintain it. Because also remember, we're going to have rains, we're going to have wind, all that stuff too. A lot of that stuff is wear and tear on houses as well too. People might be going, I just, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to deal with it. Also, the cost, right, for carrying a house. I mean, I don't care if the house is already paid for. We're talking about landscaping. We're talking about, like, you know, little rodents coming into the house because it's raining. Mm -hmm. All sorts of crazy stuff, man. So people want to get stuff off the books. So that's kind of why this time of the year tends to be a little bit better than kind of most to buy houses. Um, For me, though, the biggest thing for our current in this current market is that if interest rates go down springtime, summertime, they're down, like, in the fives or something like that. The buyer demand that we're going to get in our Sacramento market is going to be so insane. And even by that time, because 
you know, a- a- applications have increased like crazy for you guys. Like there's people looking right now and it's, you're going to see inventory levels get worse. That's my prediction. What do you think? I know. And I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and, and we've already seen uh, our applications are up significantly. Um, I don't have the exact numbers uh, with me, but I, I would guess, you know, 40, 50 percent, something like that, just from a month ago. And it's all interest rate driven. I mean, if you were to, you know, look at a graph over time of, you know, mortgage applications along with where interest rates are at, you know, applications surge as interest rates come down. So it's uh, it's it's definitely uh, making a lot of people re-engage. There were countless people that got pre-approved in the beginning of uh, 2023 of this year. And, uh, you know, they got pre-approved and like, you know, rates were in the sixes. And by the time, you know, they they finished the pre-approval process. So, you know, a day later, rates were like 8% or whatever. And so there are a lot of people that just got priced out financially. Like, you know, they they could afford it at seven, but when it got to eight, you know, it was, it was beyond reach. Um, and so there's a lot of people like that, that, you know, they've been chomping at the bit to, to buy a house, but they just couldn't make the numbers work. Well, now that financing costs are coming down, seeing a lot of those people re-engage, seeing a lot of new, uh, people, uh, come to the table as well. Um, and it's interesting, you know, Bob, Bob uh, made a comment there about, uh, he says he keeps hearing a lot of young people say that they will never be able to buy a house in California, uh, sad but true. Um, and I'm actually, uh, I, I do see uh, a, a lot of that talk, but that seems to more so be like in the, the 20s age range. And when, you know, um, you know, at least in my, you know, what I'm seeing, you know, it's like when I, I see people that are in their thirties, which by the way, the average age of a first time home buyer is 33. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, putting the numbers together and what much more people are, you know, feeling like they can make it a reality or that they have to make it a reality. Um, I just think a lot of people got to, you know, like I said earlier, you got to, you know, you know, come to terms with the fact that, you, you got to figure out how to make more money, whether that's a dual income household or, you know, you got two jobs or whatever the case is. If if you want to live in California where the weather's great and, you know, there's tons of stuff to do and, you know, all the, the reasons why, you know, was it like 60 million people or 50 million people or whatever, you know, whoever's counting live here it's, you know, there's a reason for that. So if, if you want to be a homeowner out here, you know, it's going to cost you a lot more than moving to Arkansas. Um, you know, but you kind of get what you pay for too. You know, you go into those lower cost markets outside of California and you better be ready for some harsh winters, you know, bugs, the size of, you know, trucks and all sorts of other stuff. So it's, it's a, it's a different market out there. Well, California is its own kind of beast. And like what Bob was saying about California, it's, it's, I mean, yeah, I get it. I mean, like, you know, for a long time, everyone's like, oh yeah, the Bay Area is so out of reach. LA is so mm-hmm. out of reach. And they're looking at markets like Sacramento and saying like Sacramento is still doable. Now Sacramento is getting to that point where it's like comparatively towards the, you know, how much people make, you know, average or median, like, you know, amount they make per year. It, it's starting to get a little out of control. Um, yeah just because of that, you know what I mean? Like, you know, house prices went up, what, like, you know, crazy amount job for the most part job, your job didn't start paying you that much more. So oh, no. it got Incomes to be one of those things for where, sure. yeah. And so, so for us, I, I mean, I get it. I mean, like it, the crazy part for me is I remember, um, I lived in San Francisco and I was, my first job was in the, um, in the San Francisco area. And it was like, it was a nice paying job to be honest, but like, it still wasn't even enough to even get me even the idea of even thinking about buying a house. It was like, Oh, mm-hmm. no way that's not going to happen. It's sad to think that areas like Sacramento are kind of turning into that, but I kind of knew they would be, you know, I, I kind of was always in like, one of the things about the show is we always want to encourage people that like we are Sacramento is on the ground floor of something pretty awesome. Um, the idea of all the new housing we're building, schools, commercial malls, all that stuff too, and the location, right? Like I see all these things in Texas and there are these amazing houses and they're just in the middle of nowhere, right? You know, they're mm-hmm. like there and they're like these houses. Like you gotta understand for us, I mean, like we're kind of between Lake Tahoe 
and we're between like San Francisco. We've got like Napa close by. I mean, we're still in California. Sacramento is still a very nice spot to live in California. And so I always thought to myself, I'm like, all they got to do is start updating a little bit of the food scene, which they did, Mm -hmm. you know, art scene, which they did as well too, and add a little bit more things to do. And they've been going on that direction. And so Sacramento, um, and one of the reasons why I started my kind of like my real estate company here in Sacramento was because I saw this as being like the growth potential in Sacramento. I was like, this is nuts. You know, when I first started doing real estate, it was, it was way affordable. Now it's just gotten to be crazy. Um, and it's a shame because, you know, I lived in that type of market myself. Like I said, growing up in the Bay area, I, a lot of my friends who, who I grew up with, who I went to high school with. Um, we're never even, you know, everyone moved out of state, everyone more moved out of the area mm-hmm. because it was, it was really unaffordable to live where I, where I grew up. Um, and it's a shame that Sacramento might become that way, but I don't see it turning around and going back the other direction. I see Sacramento like going charging, you know, like if you see all this stuff going on and you see all these crazy people talking about the end of the world and the real estate market prices dropping, I've yet to see a video where it mentions Sacramento. I hear the Bay Area all the time. I see like, you know, places in Texas, Florida. I don't hear the word, I don't hear the city or the area of Sacramento mentioned in any of those videos, you know? And if they do mention it, there's not statistics to back it up. So I like where we lay right now as far as being in a recession, going into a recession or whatnot. The only thing is, like Bob said, Sacramento is definitely becoming like not unaffordable comparatively towards the rest of California, but unaffordable comparatively towards what it was maybe four years ago. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and incomes aren't keeping up, you know, I, I personally, I kind of feel like Sacramento we're like what San Jose was like in the, in the nineties. I feel like, like if we could go back in time and like, you know, put ourselves in the mind of somebody that was a homeowner or wanted to become a homeowner in that area during that timeline. You know, I feel like that's kind of where we're at, where it's like things are still within reach, um, but it's like they they keep creeping up in price and you're like, wow, can it really keep going? And then it does. And then pretty soon, you know, your, you know, track house, you know, that you bought, 20 years ago or whatever is worth five times what it, you know, what it is. So, um, you know, Sacramento has got a lot to offer. I mean, just this last weekend, I took my family, we, we did a little extended weekend and went camping, uh, in Dillon's beach, took two hours and 15 minutes to get there, which is a long drive if you got small kids, but you know, I oh, mean, yeah. it, I could have gone to Napa, Tahoe. I mean, there's so many, uh, areas that you can, you know, visit and vacation to, whereas, you know, like those, my, my wife sends me, uh, like, uh, links to Zillow or Redfin or whatever all the time. She'll be like, check out this house. And it's like this gorgeous house. And it's like in North Carolina or, you know, Tennessee or something like that. And it's and you know, it's this amazing looking like farmhouse or something like that on, on property. And, you know, it's only like $500,000 or something. And I click the link and I like, I immediately go to the map and I start like zooming out on the map and I'm like, wow, how far out do I got to zoom before I see any other? Oh, okay. So we're only eight hours away from a gas station. Okay, cool. That'll be fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like I know. the, the affordability factor, you know, you got to be willing to be kind of remote basically and, and, you know, get away from resources and, and if you got kids and, and like extended family and all that stuff, that makes it even more difficult because, you know, like, like, uh, you know, the, uh, all the sports and, you know, activities and different things that are available, schools, private education, all the different things that, you know, you, you'd want to tap into if you could, you know, in a lot of those areas, you don't have any of that stuff. So it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, you got to give to get some stuff. Well, I think also the other thing too that I like about the Sacramento area is the fact that like if you work somewhere like Folsom, right, there are these little pocket communities that are completely private resort style living and you can kind of like have your cake and eat it too, i.e. you can have your little private security like, you know, resort style living and then you can go to work, 10 minute drive, boom, downtown Folsom and you're good to go. Or if you want to go to downtown 20 minutes away. So everything is relatively kind of close. And like I said, like the houses that they're selling here in Sacramento, yes, comparatively towards what it was four years ago, it's not, you know, it definitely exploded, but sure. comparatively towards what you get the Bay area, I see so many houses. Like I see a house for a million dollars. I'm like, 
Bay Area, that's like 3.5. $2 million house, I'm like, man, that's like a $6 million house right there too. And so for me, I love that. I love the idea that you can like, you know, if you're going to be paying a mortgage, and no one likes to pay a mortgage, you know, but if you are going to be paying a mortgage, or at least you have something you really love that you say like, this is awesome. You know, I love mm-hmm. my house, man. This is great. Not just location wise, but also the idea of like, you have the space, you know, you're not like sitting there and like, you can touch everyone in your family with your hands, you know, like in the Bay Area, this is like good stuff. So that's one of the things I like. All right, here, hold on. All right. Bob says, I made it to Inverness this past weekend and made it out to the ocean. Awesome being on the beach. Inverness. Oh, I like it. I think uh, Marin County. Yep, that's mm-hmm. where I grew up. That's where I born and raised in Marin. I love Inverness. I love Point Reyes. I love Bolinas. I love uh, what's oh, called yeah. uh, all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, fun times, man. The the ocean definitely does give you that energy push, you know. Too my favorite beach, though, and I will I'll give this recommendation to anyone. It does get packed. Stinson Beach in Marin oh, yeah. County. Love Stinson. It's like my favorite beach. Love that beach. Uh, there's a, even a little doggy friendly part to, that I like. So let me think. Traffic now in Marin County. Yeah. You know what? Actually, I'm listing a house in Marin um, probably in like three or four weeks. And um, it's in Terra Linda, actually. And so for me, going down there, I you know, it was so funny. I was down there last week and um, I was going off the 37 to the 101. And it was so, the traffic was so bad. I mean, it's, but the thing is Sacramento, man, you know, I, I might complain now and again about sunrise, about the traffic. We got it so good. Bay Area oh, yeah. traffic is brutal, man. It and I, you know, I'm just driving in on the 37, and then one, it's like stop, and then it's just like bleak traffic. It's like this like hazy kind of depressing weather, and it was just mm-hmm. like traffic, people beeping, everyone trying to get in front of everyone. And I'm like, this is like our traffic times three. This is it was just insane. I was like, wow, okay, I got to smack myself because I I was complaining about something I should not have been complaining about. But yeah, Marin traffic is insane. San Francisco traffic's insane. Walnut Creek, I oh no, I'm 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 good, man. I'll take 6580, the worst area in my opinion in the Sacramento area, over anything in the Bay Area easily. What do you think, Aaron? Oh, I, I was having flashbacks to you know before I I I started this company, I was a, a regional manager for a mortgage company, and all I did was drive around to, and part of my territory was the Bay Area, and. I, I used to hate it when my schedule would basically I'd have a couple of meetings like in Danville or, you know, San Ramon. And then my, my day would end out there at like three or four. And it's like, okay, so I'll get home by like eight or nine tonight, I guess. Cause it's going to take me four hours or five hours to drive, you know, 60 miles. <laughs> it's crazy. I, I don't know how people like keep their sanity and live out there, to be honest. It, it makes zero sense to me just with how congested it is. And, it, you know, my brother lives in Oakland. He loves it. And, uh, you know, he just he's just like, ah, whatever. I walk a lot of places, you know, and so it's like, you know, if you adjust your lifestyle, you know, I, I guess the traffic's not a big deal. But for people that have to use a car to get around, I mean, man, that's that's rough living. Ooh, I know, I know. Jason's like, uh, WX Highway is by far the worst right now. <laughs> All right, then we got Bob saying, hey, hey uh, by the way, Jason, um, I sent you a text. I want to get you on my Wednesday show to talk a little Sacramento. So let me know when you're game. Um, all right, weather in Marin County was nice this past weekend at near 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, Marin, I mean, it's beautiful. Don't get me wrong. Marin, like I said, I grew up there. It was a beautiful spot to live. But the only thing about Marin that for me, it got really like a little sour is that like the pretentious level in Marin just got crazy, you know? And it was just one of those things where like, you know, my old high school, I drive through the parking lot and there's all these Tesla chargers and, you know, like, you know, G wagons at the high school. And I'm like, what is going on here? And for me, that's where Marin kind of drew the line for it's so beautiful. I love like, you know, the, the point raised driving and everything too. And I love stints and I like heading out there. I think, I think it's really, really beautiful land. And I'm glad they left it. Like, and I love uh, bodega, love bodega as well too. It's just that that's mm-hmm. one of the things that made me not like Marin as much just because it was just it, it, it for me when I was there and growing up there it was a different vibe. It was like old Marin, you know. We all we all had to get jobs to get our cars, 
you know, we'd stick our hands between couches to see if we got enough money for the gas. We'd all pool our money together and like do that. We all had beater cars that like, you know, there wasn't any of this like new stuff, you know, it was, it was just like, we we're lucky if you had a car, if you were, you were sure. so lucky if you had a car and all your friends were like hounding you to be the one driving them for the weekend. Um, so for us, that's how I grew up. So to see Marin become what it is, we're like, you know, Hey, for your 16th birthday, we got your brand new G wagon. Enjoy it. You know, it's like, eh, not really where I grew up. We were a little bit more like get a job if you want a car. And that's kind of how I, how, how I was kind of raised. You know what I mean? All right. So we got this AKA 50, 80. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. That's just brutal. The 50, 80, I five. Yeah. Nuts. The other thing too, that confused me when I first moved to Sacramento is like the 80 and the business 80. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, what's going on here? What's going on? <laughs> Which one am I choosing? Which one am I choosing? Um, so yeah, now it can get a little squirrely around here, but as far as the weight, as far as the delay, the only thing, the only thing for people who are thinking about coming out here to Sacramento, I would say the only thing to wor- worry about right now is that, which is a good thing in the long run is like some of the freeways, like the fifties under major construction, there are certain areas mm-hmm. and roads that are because we realize the infrastructure isn't good enough to support all the growth, all the new home building. I mean, we're building homes, Folsom road, you name it. We're building new homes. I mean, un- unbelievably, um, the amount of new homes we're building here in Sacramento, I've never seen anything like it. So all the freeways are a little bit like right now, not the greatest, like the 50 easily double the time going to the 50 the causeway always packed. Um, and so there's, is a little bit of like, we're going through some growing pains and it's only because we're building like crazy. And right now, Sacramento is under a big kind of a transformation and it's doing fantastic. It's just that we are going through some growing pains. I, I would take, uh, the, WX connector at 5.30 p.m. with like multiple accidents on the freeway over driving like on a slow day on the 608 or 680 or any of those Bay Area uh, freeways. I mean, the the traffic, there's no comparison to uh, Bay Area traffic, maybe L.A. So, yeah, yeah. All right. We got this. Bob says students have better cars than teachers. That that for me is ridiculous. That just is absolutely ridiculous. I, you know, I think if, yeah, I couldn't imagine like, you know, yeah, I see it. I see it here too. I mean, you know, go to go Folsom high and everyone's got like their cars and everything too. I don't know. Just for me, that's just something that, that it doesn't bode well for future, <laughs> for the future. I mean, you guys start earning some money if you get yourself your mm-hmm. brand new, like, you know, BMW and then all of a sudden, yeah, so. All right, Tamales Bay. Love Tamales. Back in the yep. day, I would go to what was it, Joyce Johnson's Oyster Farm, and we'd get like a big old cooler of like uh, oysters. You know what I mean? Like we'd get it, fill mm-hmm. it up, go go back, have like a nice keg, and then just like you know, just put some oysters on the grill. Ah, so good. Memories, memories, memories. All right. So as far as we go in Sacramento, as far as the as far as what we're looking at as far as the market during the holiday season, because we're coming up on, you know, Christmas is coming up next, next week. How are you seeing the end of the year stack up? I mean, we're pretty much here. What is it like today's like the, the what 18th. So what are we, what are you, what are your like ideas? Like if someone's saying to themselves, I'm heading out on a plane on Friday, but I saw a house on Zillow. What are you thinking as far? What advice would you give based on like the applications coming in offers you're seeing become get accepted. What are you thinking as far as this time of the year for someone? I mean, if, if you're actually in a spot where you're stable and you know, you're not concerned about, you know, your future employment or income, those kinds of things. And you see a house that you, you like, and you want to jump on, my advice would be to get on it ASAP before somebody else does, because Again, it's the holiday time. It's the holiday season. Christmas is literally a week away. Right after, you know, you got a week between Christmas and New Year's. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that are checked out, not engaged, you know, not as many buyers involved. Um, something that I see every single year um, is basically, uh, you know, as people check out through the holiday season, they all come back and re engage towards the end of January. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with that's typically when their employers mail out their W-2s and you get like your year end tax info. And then all of a sudden you're gearing up to file your taxes and you get your refund and you're going to be using your refund towards your down payment and et cetera, et cetera. So it's like you kind of have this little window of opportunity where there's just you got less competition. So 
Um, and because of that, and because of the time of the year and what Mark was talking about earlier about how most sellers, not all sellers, because you'll find some listings up right now, I'm sure, with pictures of Christmas trees and Elf on the Shelf, but the majority of, of the homes that are selling right now are going to be vacant. So, you know, vacant is, you know, if, if I'm not living in it and I'm and I own it, it's losing me money. I still have to pay, even if I own it free and clear, I still got to pay property taxes. I should be paying homeowners insurance, maintenance, all that stuff. So it's just eating a hole in my pocket. And because of the time of the year and the weather and all that stuff, I got less buyers coming to me as a seller to, you know, to buy my property. So if you're actually engaged and you're, you know, you're writing an offer, um, I'm going to, you know, most likely be way more willing to work with you versus when I've got 10 other offers that I'm now trying to, you know, take the pick of the litter. So it's, it, there's, there's opportunities for sure to be made right now. Yeah. For me, if it was me and I'm thinking to myself, okay, I want to buy some time in 2024. I'm a little worried inventory is going down because interest rates and buyer demand is picking up. What should I do? I would probably, number one is, of course, I would interview realtors, interview lenders to make sure that I have my team together. I would also figure out what communities, floor plans, like what, what I really, really wanted in a house. Um, and then I would probably get everything ready to go. And then I would start probably looking at houses that somewhat match what I'm looking for. I, I wouldn't go any further down than an eight. Eight, nines, mm -hmm. or tens. Those are the houses I'm looking at. Because honestly, even with like lower interest rates, I'm still not paying for it. That's just me, my own self. And I would probably look towards the houses that had been on the market for more than maybe two weeks. And I mean, I would say to myself, okay, like that house in, house in Folsom right now is on the market for a million dollars. What would, if I got that house, what, you know, what price would I be happy getting that house? And if I could outline what that looked like at the current interest rates, I mean, there's nothing wrong with like throwing a couple of low offers out there. I've seen low offers get taken this time of the year. You don't lose anything, but what if you could get that house that's a million dollars for like $900,000? You don't get it if you don't ask. I mean, like throw out a low offer, figure that out. You might get, a, I mean, nine out of 10 times, you're probably gonna get the Heisman, but at the same time, that one shot that someone just wants to unload, distressed seller, and they're saying like, you know what, let's just do it. We're gonna do a reduction anyways. You could get lucky, but I do think this time of the year, if you're saying to yourself, why not go low? I mean, mm -hmm. that, that would be me myself. I'd be going low and I would be like, if I got it for 900, I'm happy. If I get it for more, if you know, we go counter situation, nah, I don't want it. I'll move on to the next. I don't really need to buy right now. But if the price came out that I liked, yeah, I'd buy right now. That's where I'd be in my thinking. What do you think of that, Aaron? Yeah, I, there, you're definitely going to have a better chance having a lower bid offer accepted in this market than you will in the spring when everybody and their mom's fighting you for the property. I think, though, that you just got to be realistic with like, like I got a buddy, for instance, that every time he calls me up about, you know, a house that he's, he's found online that he wants to buy. You know, he as soon as he he uh, tells me how much he wants to offer on it, I know right out of the gate that that deal's not going anywhere because he's just being so lowball with it that it's like, you know, you, you got to be realistic. Um, but definitely, uh, you know, you're going to have a better chance now than you will, uh, you know, in the later part of the year. Something else too, you and I were were touching on this a little bit earlier um, before we before we went live. Um, something that. I don't know for sure that this will impact us, you know, in, in the, you know, the coming months or this spring or whatever, but I'm seeing it across the nation. Um, I haven't seen it on any listings in the Sacramento market yet um, because all the real estate markets, they're controlled by MLSs, like multiple listing services, and they create rules for that, you know, that area. And so, for whatever reason, the, you know, SAC Metro's, you know, hasn't, hasn't rolled anything out on this stuff yet. But the thing I'm talking about was, you know, a couple of months ago, there was all the stuff in the news about real estate agents, you know, they lost this big lawsuit and they're going to have to pay, um, you know, sellers will no longer pay real estate commissions to the buyer's agent. And I'm now seeing listings in other states, um, because we do business all across the country, but I'm seeing uh, listings in other states where in the listing, it says that the seller is not paying the buyer's agent's commission. 
which means that you as the buyer, you got to come up with that money, which that adds to your down payment, your closing costs, all that stuff. And if, you know, if the, you know, we're talking about basically affordability, becoming a nation of renters, et cetera. And so if part of that barrier to entry of becoming a homeowner is the money that you got to come up with to buy the house in the first place, what, what's that going to do when, when we got that, you know, monkey wrench thrown into our system out here? I, I don't know how it's going to affect us, like I said, but uh, I'm seeing it in other markets and it is something in the back of my mind that I'm, I'm somewhat concerned about for Sacramento. What, what do you think on that? I mean, here's the thing for me. Number one is in California, I think double ending a deal should have been outlawed a long time ago. I sure. think that our legislation was completely lazy and the idea of double ending a deal, it was in place. So that, that way, basically one lawyer for a case, hey, I'm representing the defendant and the plaintiff and we're good. A lot of listing agents love this stuff because they do a lot of double ending and they're loving life. Double ending mm -hmm. is not fair. No matter how you cut it, one realtor cannot represent a buyer and the seller fairly. It's just totally. not one person is going to get slighted in it. So if that was in effect, which should have been in effect a long time ago, this situation would be a little easier to remedy. I do think mm -hmm. that as far as a commission, there should be some kind of guidelines where if a commission is agreed upon, half should go to the buyer's agent, half should go to the listing agent. Down the middle. Boom. Boom. There you go. Is it 3%? 1.5 to the seller's agent, 1.5 to the buyer's agent. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I do just as much listings as I do buyers. Um, I do new homes as well too, but I'll tell you something, a buyer's agent spends money on gas. And a lot of times you won't even get someone into contract because you can't find the house. A listing agent's always gonna have a listing and they actually have to just go to the house, have an open house. And normally in the Sacramento area, they put a big sign in the yard, they cross their fingers, they throw some weird presentation at a client saying that, oh yeah, we got all these Bay Area buyers and whatnot. And then you cross your fingers and you, you know, so for me, that's how I, I kind of look at it. Right. And I think mm -hmm. honestly, that's kind of how it'd be fair. That's how it should be done. But the biggest thing about this is, and this is where real estate always kind of takes a little bit of a turn for me. Lenders like you, realtors like me, title reps, everyone in our ecosystem, we're all connected. So mm -hmm. if something like this gets into effect where all of a sudden buyers, agents, you know, the, the bottom line is like, and I was telling Aaron this offline, I'm like, Lennar, Lennar is kind of a forecasting what's our future. Lennar was very, very smart. I hate to say Lennar was smart. They've got the title, they've got the lending, they've got the selling and the buying underneath one umbrella. Where you're going to notice probably in the future is the fact that like, you know, you're going to see big companies like Zillow say, hey, we're going to do your mortgage for you. Because we're doing mass quantities of mortgage, we can cut down fees and they become almost like lenders at the builders where they're saying like, no, I got, I got it. We're good. Realtor fees also, as far as Zillow goes, you're going to have big companies come in and just do it under one umbrella. And listing agents right now think that they're exempt. They're, oh, you know, it's happening to buyer's agents. It's happening to everybody in this ecosystem. Now, as far as I go, I get the fact that buyers are kind of going like, you know, why, why should we pay for this? And sellers are thinking, why should we pay for this? And mm -hmm. there is a little part of me because I am, I've been a buyer and I've been a seller. I get it. But there should be some sort of underlined idea that everyone should have representation. Everybody, whether you're a yeah. buyer or whether you're a seller, you should have representation. The idea of double ending, it's just ludicrous that they've actually allowed this to go on as long as they have, because that's just ridiculous to me. Um, I love your and I think, I love your attorney huh? analogy with with the double ending of it. It's like I, I feel oh, yeah. like when when somebody's double ending it, it's like okay, the the seller is getting the private law firm attorney version, and then the buyer is getting the public defender. No offense to any public defenders out there, but you know they're they're just not getting the the same level of of service by any means. I've I've never seen a scenario where it was like because uh, how how do you how do you uh you like if if my job is to be your fiduciary to to you know negotiate on your behalf to fight for you well how do i do that for you but then i also do the same thing for the like who wins i can't i can't you know be the same for both somebody's got to you know somebody's got to take a you know a loss so who's it going to be Oh, exactly. And that's the thing. It will always be one of the people. And it's just, it's not a fair system when it comes to that stuff. It should be 
you know, everyone should get their representation. And if there is a commission agreed upon, it should be split 50-50. And maybe there should be a part on the contract where it says buyer pays for this, seller pays for this. Because there also has to be a little bit of something in the contract based on the market we're in. Do you know what I mean? Because sure. imagine this. Imagine this. Okay. All of a sudden, buyer's agents, for the most part, are getting nothing. And the listing agent is getting all, all the... And all of a sudden, we flip into a buyer's market. Then all yeah. of a sudden... We got no buyer's agents who were, I'm, I'm not doing this. And then all of a sudden, listing agents are like, uh, uh, how am I going to sell this house? I got to start upping the commission for buyer's agent. All of a sudden, that becomes a thing. So it, there has to be also something that plays into that. I think that at the end of the day, though, the real, realtor has to understand, and this is coming from me as well, that we are in a service industry. And you got to make it fair to the buyers. And you got to make it fair to the sellers. Um, but at the same time, I do think that whatever that agreed upon commission, whoever is set to pay for whatever, that should probably be divided up between the listing agent and the buyer's agent. And it should just be like, it's a 50, 50 split. There's no arguing it. This is it. So if you go and you talk to someone and you say, I'm going to list your house, it's going to be a 3% commission. That 3% commission legally should be split between the buyer's agent and the seller's agent, because at the end of the day, fair is fair. That's my two cents on that mm -hmm. one. Yeah. All right. Hold Hold on. All right. Saxon Lender. I got to love it. Uh, when buyers think they get a deal, when they employ the listing agent. Oh my Lord. I mean, seriously, that's the craziest thing in the world. It's like, it's like, you know, what was that? Like Hansel and Gretel. They're like, come on in. I'll cook you. I'll, I'll, I'll bake you cookies. Kids come on in. Oh my God. That's literally, are, yeah. Yeah. That's literally the only reason why you would do that. Like to write an off or to, to approach the listing agent as the buyers that, you think that that's gonna by you're basically playing into that agent's greed that they're gonna want to earn two commissions instead of one and that's how you're gonna get your offer accepted but you're gonna you're totally gonna get screwed on your offer like the, you know it's like what i said earlier like you know a, a winning offer is that you you know or a good deal is that you got your offer accepted it wasn't that like you got the price that you wanted and the terms and all that it's like no no you just got your offer accepted that's that's kind of what you get when you go, you know, directly to the listing agent and you do the dual agency thing. Well, the other thing too, is this is how I kind of feel is it's like all about just life establishing relationships, right? So the established mm -hmm. relationship is already between the seller and the listing agent. They've established their Correct. relationship, their trust, their contracts and everything too. So the buyers, the buyer comes in late to the party. Who do you think the agent is going to really kind of sway towards the person that they have the longer relationship with the one that they've kind of like broke bread with, they're going to sell the house or the buyer that comes in late to the party. I mean, like, it's just common sense for me. I mean, I look at this and I say like, you know, where, where are we going with this? So I think like a long time ago, we should have just outlawed do, uh, you know, double ending because like I said, I mean, anyone who says differently is probably like a listing agent who's just been relying on double ending for their entire career. But for the most part, double ending, no one gets a fair shake with that one. All right. Bob says agents who double, uh, double and always favor the seller and the buyers don't know that completely completely true. And so for me, all this stuff that we just mentioned about like listings, like that have like, let's say, Hey, no commission to the buyer's agent. Like it, that, that's a whole ball of wax for me. Okay. Cause number one, it's like, who's representing the buyer. Cause I mean, mm -hmm. like, let's say you go, they have an agent named Bob and Bob is a buyer's agent. And he's like, okay, well, there's no buyer's commission. So, I mean, legally I can't even pay my brokerage anything. So I can't represent you. So you have to go with the seller's agent because I can't represent you because I can't even pay anything towards my brokerage or nothing. You know, the brokers won't even allow me to do it because mm -hmm. it's free work and they're not going to allow me to do this. So then the buyer's like, well, I get this. Okay. Well, I'm just going to go and talk to the listing agent. And so does the listing agent then need to represent the buyer. What I mean by that is, can the listing agent says, no, 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 you're the buyer, but I'm not, I'm not going over any forms. I'm not going to any contracts with you. I don't have to. I'm representing the seller. You're just like, uh, yeah, I'm not making any money off you. So you're just coming in the door with your offer and we're good, you know, and maybe there's, an, you know, here's an inspection reports. I'm not going over them with you. If you want it, it's yours. Like, where is that gray area? Like, is the listing agent representing the buyer? if they can't bring on their own agent in the transaction, 
will the listing agent be forced to sign something saying that they will represent both parties? And why would they if they're not getting paid from the buyer's agent to do so? No, oh, you, you wouldn't want to take on the liability and the risk. I mean, part of people don't realize this, but one of the reasons why you want to have a real estate agent represent you is that they're they're basically following contract law. And depending on what state and your jurisdiction and all that stuff, there are regulations and laws that protect you as the buyer or protect you as the seller. And if things go squirrely and a lawsuit needs to be filed or an insurance claim or something like that, um, you know, that's that's where, you know, that the the real estate agent really kind of earned their uh, their keep besides helping you get into contract and stuff. Um, you know, if you don't have that representation, uh, you know, that that's going to make for some interesting lawsuits for sure. But if if, uh, you know, if the brokerage is not making money off of it, they're not going to take on the liability. So it's ultimately it's I, I think that this will hopefully get ironed out in a way that works good for consumers because the buyer is going to get screwed in this current scenario. And, uh, I, you know, it's just going to make a already pretty, you know, bumpy uh, market, you know, even even more tumultuous. Well, that's the thing. It's like, let's say, for example, you buy the house, you don't have a buyer's agent represent you, you buy the house and all of a sudden, like the house has like a bad roof or half this and you weren't explained that in the disclosure, like, you know, who, who do you, who do you point the finger at? I mean, mm -hmm. Who, who's got your back on this? And I'm not, you know, I'm not, I, I get the idea that, you know, the buyers and the sellers are saying like, you know, we should pay for them. You know, like I get it, but I'm just like looking through it as far as like a chess game going like, huh? Okay. It's like going to court without a lawyer and going like, yeah, you know, I'm just relying on the defense to be really nice to me and fair. They're not going to go for blood. <laughs> they're not going to do it. You know, mm -hmm. they're good people over there. They're, they got my best interest at heart. I mean, like, yeah, I, it's, it's, a, I don't know. It's a little sketchy. Uh, Jason says the exact flaw in the court case. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's so many flaws in this and I'm not saying, look, I'm not saying this isn't like, give me more money or I should get this or I should get that. I'm thinking about it just from an interesting standpoint of like, what makes sense? You know, for mm -hmm. me, I mean, honestly, I've thought this for a long, long time. And if you could see the history of my transactions, you say I don't double end. I don't think double ending is is legal. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's right. I, I think someone will always get the shaft in that situation. And number two is I think if a commission is agreed upon, it should be split 50-50. And there's no wavering on that. And I think that that makes sense. Whatever that commission is, um, I think that that's that. So that's where I stand on the whole thing. Um, but it is going to be interesting going forward because, I mean, like, you know, I, I don't know. It, it's, it's just a weird one right now. But it's 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 kind of like how I can say it. Like it's, I, I can digest it, but I'm still kind of like running through everything in my head as far as like, what does it mean? Like on a chessboard, boom, 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 boom. I'm, it's, mm -hmm. it's still hard for me to kind of figure out like where this thing ends. I mean, I personally think it's going to end with a company like Zillow controlling everything, knocking out buyer's agent, listing agents, mortgage brokers, title companies, and just under one umbrella. It's going to be like Redfin versus Zillow. Who are you going with to sell a house, to buy a house, to finance a house? And at the end of the day, I mean, is that something that we want? You know, is that something that's fair? Is that something that is kind of is is that something that we we're going towards and we should be avoiding it now? And that's the crazy part because you know it it just I don't know it's kind of a weird thing. All right, so Jason says it's also on the seller if they're that greedy when they bought the house they're now selling commission was paid by the seller and now they don't want to contribute. Yeah, and that's the thing though too, like with the sellers and the buyers and all this stuff too. It's it's, you know, it's kind of like the old adage, like you get what you pay for, but that's another mm -hmm. thing too. And that's, this is something that I like truly believe. I think that like, you know, and I've seen this a lot in, in, in our area. Cause I mean, we're not, we're not as flashy as San Francisco or Los Angeles, but I do think when someone hires a listing agent, um, to represent them or a buyer's agent to represent them. They need to know exactly like their track record, meet with them and vet them a little bit too. I think for a lot of times, listing agents kind of just relax on their history of like how many sales they've done, putting the sign mm -hmm. in the ground and everything too. I think right now what I'm seeing is a lot of people like having this like list of services to show people what they actually do 
to sell houses? Like, are they providing staging? Are they providing landscaping? Are they going to clean up the house? Are they going to, they can provide cookies at the open houses. But I do think mm-hmm. a lot of people who have listed houses and have been successful with that in the past, I think a lot of people have kind of like put that on cruise control where I think now that if let's say you're a seller and you're selling your house and you're going to pay 5% and you're paying two and a half, two and a half. I do think that you need something to, you need to show what you're paying for on paper and they need to be deliverables that you need to give, you know, whoever you're working with. Do you know what I mean? Like there needs to be something because I do think that I, I see a lot of times I know listing agents going to, you know, Oh yeah, we have all these Bay area buyers. We do crazy marketing and half the people are like, okay, I, I mean, I guess so you're, you're with that company. So it makes sense. But I think that like a lot of that stuff needs to be called BS on and figure out who actually is going to market, promote, and show your house to more people and actually do the job. And I think that's one of the things for me that I think in 2024, we're going to see a lot. Sellers are going to say, I don't mind paying the, the amount if you can get me more for my house, but how are you going to get me more for my house? You, how are you going to do it? What are you going to do that's going to get me more money than Bob, the other realtor over there? And I think at that step, you got to step up and kind of show what you got. So... I tell you what, man, if you're a listing agent and, and you, uh, you're showing up with the Otis Spunk Meyer chocolate chip cookies for your open house and the whole house smells like the baked chocolate chip cookies, you bet you ever been in the new home model homes and they got that going on and you're like, wow, I feel like I'm like at my mom's house or something. And there's like a nostalgic thing that like kicks in. It's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty cool. Dude, I, I, cookies, cookies get me. They always cookies and uh, <laughs> nice drinks. I yeah, I yeah, it, it's good. All right, Bob says good buyers agents will still be able to get a full commission, even if they uh, change the rules, especially in the high end. I think so. I mean, I think the idea that you need to kind of um, how can I say it? like outline exactly plans. I think you need to kind of like show up. I think you need to kind of do like like the way we work, right? And if you've worked with our team, normally what you're going to get is myself and also another agent on. Uh, with you. And we're going to go both of us usually to show you houses, work through the contracts, explain everything and kind of like do the research and all that stuff too. So I think that for us, I've often thought that, that one agent is, might not be enough in this market as far as researching, as far as showing, as far as negotiating contracts and everything too. Um, and part of the reason why also we kind of set up a team. Um, and now we got like, I think six people on the team is because that, you know, let's say like someone from the team is out there showing houses all day and then they have to write up a contract. At that point in time, no matter how good you are, no matter how much you think you're the most amazing agent in the world, you're tired. You've been on the road, you've been seeing a bunch of houses. So the idea is handing off to someone who's fresher, who might be able to already start the process for you. I think that like efficiency, I think, you know, you, I think right now also, you know, you have to justify your worth to your clients. And I think like Bob, I'll go off what Bob said too. You know, you'll still be able to get your full commission, but you got to be good at what you do. And in this market, it's going to be, it's going to be like, it's going to be the thinning of the herd right now in real estate. I can't even imagine what it's going to look like for buyers, agents and listing agents in summer, you know, and also for your, for your, for what you do when rates go down, I mean, the refi, thing is gonna be nuts i mean people are gonna be jumping on the refi things like crazy refi has already started up man you know the rates have started to drop and and we're already refinancing people like crazy but you know it's it's only gonna get crazier as as rates come down um i'm excited for that because that's usually when my competition checks out and they stop talking to real estate agents and forget about how doing you know how to do purchase loans which this good thing never forgets those those uh things so you know, that'll be a, a good uh, opportunity for, for us that I'm looking forward to for sure. Well, it's interesting. I mean, and by the way, guys, if you guys are enjoying this broadcast, this transparent talk on real estate, please like, comment, subscribe. Um, it means a lot to us. But here's the thing for me. One thing I have noticed, which is kind of nuts, is that I have noticed a lot of realtors right now saying they're, they're taking two paths. One is solar. Two is they're jumping into lending because they know the refi craze is coming. It's mm-hmm. gonna be an interesting market going forward. I personally am not. I love real estate, that's what I do. I only do what I love. All right, realtors just need to get after it until these rules change for you. Lenders have already uh, uh, have already gone through it when the crash happened, that was the first step. Now realtors and real estate 
is in the crosshairs. Yeah, it is always going to be like that. And here's the thing about real estate in general. Someone's someone's job is always going to be kind of like kind of like focus on, right? Like the refi craze, lenders make out like crazy and you guys do that. But then all of a sudden the market pulls back a little bit. You guys are in the crosshairs. We, mm -hmm. you know, we have our moment and then all of a sudden we're in the crosshairs. I think one of the things that I would like to see in the future though, as far as like, as far as lenders, as far as title reps, as far as every, I think everyone's kind of, kind of come together as a community a little bit more because I do think that in our industry, it's a little bit separated. And I think that like the idea is if everyone came together, everyone could work together to best serve buyers and sellers in this market. Um, and I think that that I feel very kind of missing, right? I feel like there's always like, you're on one team, someone else is on another team. You know what I mean? Like, like Aaron, you and I are working together and then there's another team over there that's doing this and it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, as like real estate professionals, lenders, title reps or whatever, we should all have that idea that we can bounce ideas off each other, figure out what makes sense, figure out what's fair, figure out how we can best serve buyers and sellers and not be so competitive that it feels like we're, that the buyers and sellers are jumping into a shark tank, you know? So I don't know. I mean, for me, like, it'd be nice to see that. But like, like I said, I run into realtors all the time and they're telling me about people that their own brokerages, they cut their legs out underneath them, grab their listings, you know, grab their buyers. And I'm like, it doesn't have to be that way, man. I mean, it just, it, I don't know, it just doesn't. It's very cutthroat. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Also, like I'm said, I want you on my show on Wednesday, Jason. So let me know when you can show up. Our right, Aaron, any parting words before we say adios? You guys have a, a very Merry Christmas and we'll, uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for watching. All right, guys. And for me, Wednesday, 530, we're going to talk a little about Sacramento. We're going to talk about new homes and how they compare with resale, current inventory on the market. And if the new home builders are in trouble or if they're just laying in wait for 2024 when interest rates go down and inventory goes even lower. It's going to be a fun show. Can't wait for you guys. And uh, that's it. I'm out of here. Guess what, guys? The video just ended. But don't worry, we have more videos just like that one right over there. And if you missed that red subscribe button during the course of the video, we got you covered right there. Hit that subscribe button. We promise to bring you some amazing content. We won't let you down. Now, if you're looking for a team in the Sacramento metro area to work with, we'd love to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. We always include a Zoom link down below. So book a time where we can talk to you a little one-on-one, -on -one, find out exactly what your real estate needs are.